Ladies and gentlemen, I'm Ed Bowsman, and this is the Preaching Christ broadcast. It is written, all the churches of Christ salute you. In just a few moments, I will return with a message on Hebrews chapter 1 entitled, God Hath Spoken. But first, listen to Philip Sands as he sings, Call to Glory. and glory of your name. God, having of old time spoken unto the fathers through the prophets in divers portions and divers manners, hath in the end of these days spoken unto us through his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds. When he had made purification of sins, who being the effulgence of his glory and the very image of his substance, when he had made purification for sins, and upholding all things by the word of his power, sat down by the right hand of the majesty on high having become so much better than the angels, as he hath inherited a more excellent name than they. For in which of the angels saith he at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And again, when he bringeth his firstborn into the world, I will be to him a father, and he will be to me a son. And when he bringeth his firstborn into the world, he saith unto the angels, Let all the angels of God worship him who maketh his angels winds, and his ministers a flame of fire. But of the Son, he saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. The 
The scepter of uprightness is a scepter of thy kingdom. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore God, thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. Thou, Lord, in the beginning didst lay the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the works of thy hands. They shall perish, but thou continuest. They shall wax old as of the garment, as a mantle, they shall be rolled up. As a garment, they shall be changed. But thou art the same, and thy years shall not fail. For unto which of the angels saith he at any time, Sit thou on my right hand, till I make thine enemies the footstool of thy feet? Are they not all ministering spirits? sent forth to do service for the sake of them that shall inherit salvation. Hebrews chapter 1, God hath spoken. God has spoken to the human race twice. Once he spake in the Old Testament, and then he had something to say in the New Testament. And when the Lord gave his message to us, he did not unload the whole thing at one time. In the Garden of Eden, when Adam and Eve were expelled, God did not come to Adam and Eve and say, Now, here is a copy of my Bible. The words of Jesus will be written in red, and I want you to take this Bible and read it. It will be your guide as to how you can regain paradise. Not only that, but how all of your descendants can have paradise also. This is my Bible. Take it now, Adam, and read it. That's not the way that God did it. He did not give him the whole load at one time. The only Bible that Adam had was when God told him the seed of the woman shall bruise the head of the serpent, and the serpent shall bruise his heel. The only Bible that Adam had was when God said to him, In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread all the days of thy life. Dust thou art, and unto dust thou shalt return. The only Bible Adam and Eve had was when he said to her, In sorrow and pain shall you bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. That's the only Bible they had. Because, you see, God spoke to the fathers in divers portions and divers matters. He gave a bit here and a bit there and a bit somewhere else, a little bit at a time. Later on, he gave the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt make no graven image. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Honor thy father and thy mother. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Thou shalt not covet. And yet when the Lord gave the Ten Commandments to Moses, that wasn't the entire will of God either. God spoke to man in divers portions, a little bit here and a little bit there. Later on, Paul would say, By the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. The Ten Commandments was not the whole will of God. He gave it in bits and portions. When Jesus gave the Great Commission, this is what he did not say. He did not say, Go ye into all the world and preach the Ten Commandments, preach the law to every creature. Those who do will be saved. By the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. It was not until Jesus came that it could be said, All Scripture is inspired of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, 
that the man of God might be complete, thoroughly furnished unto every good work. Everything we need to know is in this book. God's will is complete. He has spoken unto us in these last days through His Son. He spoke to us in divers portions until His will, His Word was complete. And uh, today we hear televangelists, radio evangelists, people in churches say, well, the Lord appeared to me and told me to do thus and so. The Lord never did anything like that at all because His will is complete. There are three reasons why people say the Lord appeared to them. They're either lying, drunk, or crazy because God's will is complete. God having of old times spoken unto the fathers in divers portions. Not only did He speak in divers portions, but He also spoke to mankind in divers manners. He had different ways of doing it. One time He spoke through the handwriting on the wall. One time he spoke to Moses through the burning bush. He spoke in dreams. He spoke to young Samuel. Young Samuel was in bed one night. He heard a voice that said, Samuel, Samuel. He got up and ran to the room of Eli, the prophet, and said, what do you want? Eli said, nothing, go back to bed. He went back to bed, and the voice came, Samuel, Samuel. He ran back to Eli again, what do you want? Eli said, it must be the Lord talking to you, go back. Again the voice came, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, Speak, Lord, thy servant heareth. If God would appear to somebody like that today, most of the preachers today would say, Listen, Lord, thy servant speaketh. But God doesn't do that anymore because he spoke in divers portions until his will was complete and in divers manners. One time he actually spoke to a man through a, a donkey. Balaam the prophet was riding along, going where he had no business going in the first place. And as he was riding, there was a, an angel with a drawn sword ready to slice him. And the donkey saw the angel, but Balaam didn't. And the donkey jumped out of the way and mashed Balaam's foot, and Balaam gave him a whack, and the donkey said, Why are you beating me? Haven't I always been a good mount for you? And then Balaam saw the angel, and he realized then that he was a bigger one than the one that he was riding. People may say, well, you, you, you believe that? You believe a donkey could talk? Well, yes, a, a donkey has a mouth, he has lips, he has teeth, he has a tongue, he has a palate, he has a larynx, a pharynx, he has lungs, he has, he has all the equipment, it's just a matter of uh, the Lord uh, letting him do it. I can think of something more difficult to believe than that. If you could have taken one of these modern day cassette recorders back to those people in that day and said, listen to it, this thing can talk. You think they would have believed that? And besides, I have heard the braying of a donkey many times. Every time I hear somebody say, oh, there's no God, I hear the bring of a donkey. Every time I hear of somebody say, oh, uh, it doesn't make any difference uh, about this church stuff, uh, one church is as good as another, I hear the bring of a donkey. Every time I, I hear somebody say, oh, I tell you, I don't know about this baptism stuff, uh, being immersed for the remission of sins, that's, that's not too important. Whenever I hear that, I hear the bring of a donkey. If I would tell you how many times I've heard the bring of a donkey, you'd get tired of hearing it. God spoke to the human race in divers portions and in divers manners. But in these last days, He has spoken unto us through the Lord Jesus Christ. It says, He upholds all things by the word of His power. God hath spoken. Think of the tremendous power of God's Word. Listen to an example of His power. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. How is that for power? The sheer, naked power of God's Word. And then God decided, I need some sky. I need some stratosphere. I need some atmosphere. I need some ionosphere. I need some ozone. And God said, 
And it was so. There's real power for you, upholding all things by the word of his power. Then God said, well, I, I don't know. There's too much water here. I need some land. I need uh, a continent over here and a continent there. And God said, and it was so. And then God said, it looks awful barren. I need some trees. I need some lilies, some roses. I need some vegetation. And God said, and then God said, I need some artificial light. I'll make a sun to rule by day and a moon to rule by night. And it says, and he made the stars also, almost as an afterthought. And God said, how's that for power? Then God said, we need some fish, some whales, some tadpoles. We need some trout, some bass, and so And God said, and it was so. Then God created the animals. He said, I need some dinosaurs. I need some dodo birds. I need some mammoths. I need some giraffes. I need some turtles. And God said, and then God said, let us make man in our own image. And God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit created man. God said, that's the power of God. You've seen perhaps that picture of Hercules holding the world on his shoulder, standing on the back of a turtle. Jesus is the Hercules who holds the world. He upholds all things by the word of his power. And he stands not on the back of a turtle. He stands on his own essence. He stands on his word. And God said. So, what did God say in Hebrews chapter 1? Well, he had a lot to say. One thing he had to say was he had something to say about the purification for sins. When he had made purification for sins, he sat down by the right hand of the majesty on high. That's what he did, and that's what God said, that Jesus made purification for sins. How would you purify sin? How would you go about purifying a septic tank? How would you purify a sewer? How would you purify something like that so you could live in it and where it would be palatable? You could far more easily purify a sewer under your own devices as to purify sin. I don't believe Gabriel could come down here in this world and live with me one day and go back home at night to heaven at sundown without taking a bath in Lysol or from all to high. Jesus made purification for sins. God hath spoken. Not only did he make purification for sins, but he had something also to say about uh, Worship, when he bringeth his firstborn into the world, again he saith unto the angels, Let all the angels of God worship him. He said, Gabriel, worship the infant Jesus. Michael, worship the infant Jesus. Cherubims, come here, worship the infant Jesus. Seraphims, worship the infant Jesus. All of you angels come and worship him. Ladies and gentlemen, if the angels and the cherubims and the seraphims and all the host of glory fall down and adore the Christ child, adore the Son of God, if they worship him, what about our worship? How can we afford to let something else stand in the way of our worship on the Lord's day? To let something take the place of the Lord's Supper on the Lord's day? God hath spoken. Not only that, but God had something to say about the authority of his word. He said, Jesus sits on the throne of his glory, and the scepter of uprightness is the scepter of his kingdom. Jesus rules. He said, all authority hath been given unto me in heaven and on earth. Jesus has the authority. Someone wrote me a letter one time and said, the reason that you preach the message that you preach is because you belong to the church of Christ and you are required to do it, just as I belong to this particular church, whatever it was, I've forgotten now, and I'm required to preach something else. Well, I wish that were true to a certain extent, but it's not true. Actually, if most of the people I know in the church of Christ had their way, they would rather I did not preach the message that I preach. They would rather I preach something else and not bear down too much on the terms of pardon and the authority of God's Word. 
The reason I preach the message that I preach is not by the authority of any church. I do not preach it by the authority of any elders. I preach what I preach by the authority of Peter and Paul by the authority of the inspired writers, by the authority of the Word of God, by the authority of Jesus Christ, God hath spoken. He had something also to say about uh, living the Christian life. He said, he has hated iniquity and loved righteousness. That shows you how and what Jesus thinks about sin. He hates it. He despises it. He abominates it. And as Paul said, we need to abhor that which is evil. Today we seem to have a love affair with sin. We laugh at it. We tolerate it. Not long ago on television I saw a high-ranking government official in a program on AIDS, and he was being interviewed by this young lady, and they were, she was asking him questions. And she asked him this question. She said, now, she said, uh, if you and I were going to go to bed together, what advice would you give me? And I'm glad to say that this high-ranking official said, I want to make it perfectly clear that you and I are not going to bed together. And she giggled and said, well, well what's wrong with me? And he said, well, I have been married 49 years, and that's not my lifestyle. Of course, I'm glad he said what he said, but he also could have said, because I don't want to be immoral and because I don't want to go to hell. That's what he could have said. I'm glad he said what he said, however. But you see, we have this lighthearted feeling about sin. It's fun, fun, fun. Jesus hates it. He loves righteousness and he hates iniquity. God hath spoken. What did God say? God had something to say about the angels. He said, are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to do service for the sake of them that shall inherit salvation? Angels are spirits. We can't see them. But angels, it seems, are able to minister unto us who are Christians, not those who are not Christians, but those who are Christians. They minister unto them who shall inherit salvation. We don't know when they minister. It will be curious someday to be in heaven and to sit down under the tree of life and have some angel come and tell me all the times that he was with me in this life. There is one time, however, that we do know when angels will be with us as far as this life is concerned. In the 16th chapter of Luke, there was a man who was a beggar, who was a righteous man. He was in the covenant, and he died, and it says, the angels came and carried him away into Abraham's bosom. Nothing is said about angels carrying the wicked man away unless we could infer that demons came and carried his shrieking soul into the land of the eternally damned. So when a person dies who's a Christian, the angels come and carry him away. That's logical. After all, if you die as a Christian, you stand outside of your body, you look at it, and you say, well, why? I don't know where I am. Which is the way? Angels will come and show you the way. Oh, I want to be an angel. And where the angels stand, a crown upon my forehead and a harp within my hand. There right before the Savior, so glorious and so bright, I'll make the sweetest music and I'll praise him day and night. Until that day, I'm like angels and serve us. God hath spoken midst the storms and doubts of unbelief we fear. Stands a book eternal that the world holds dear. Through the restless ages, it remains the same. Tis the book of God, and the Bible is his name. Tis the book that tells us of the Father's love, how he sent the Savior from heaven above, who through richest promise creates hope within, for tis through his blood that we are saved from every sin. Tis the book that tells us of the will of God, of the Savior's teaching as the world he trod, how he soothes earth's sorrow and relieves each woe. Through him strength is given to conquer every foe. Tis the book that tells us of eternal life after years of struggle 
in a world of strife, and this glorious promise over death's dark fears is the world's best hope in an age of constant fears. The old book and the old faith are the rock on which I stand. The old book and the old faith are the bulwark of the land. Through storm and stress, they stand the test. In every nation blessed, the old book and the grand old faith are the hope of every land. Hebrews chapter 1, God hath spoken. To those of you to whom God has spoken, remember Paul said, Communicate unto him that teacheth in all good things. So come on, brethren, communicate. You'll see the address of this broadcast right there on your screen in just a few moments. For those of you who are outside of Christ, we say the validity of this message can be proven if you will just open the Bible and read it. We will glorify the King of kings. We will Ship here. 